Adolphe Bogarcher, ça, ça est, euh, est euh, quelqu'un qui travaille sur les virus de la grippe en général. Il est espagnol, il travaille aux États-Unis et il a particulièrement, enfin, moi, pour moi, parmi les travaux importants qu'il a menés, c'est ceux sur le, le virus de la grippe espagnole, ce qui est un paradoxe puisque vous savez que le virus de la grippe espagnole, c'est les Américains qui ont dit qu'elle était espagnole alors qu'elle est née aux États-Unis. Les Américains ont l'habitude de dire que c'est la faute des autres et donc euh, ils ont dit que c'est le Spanish flu, mais le Spanish flu aurait été aidé aux États-Unis. Mais ils ont mis le blame sur les Spanish. Donc, c'est pour un Spanish guy to uh, reconstitute the truth in the USA to say it's come from the USA. You're welcome. I'm very happy that, that you, you get time to come here and speak about your words. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Je voudrais remercier le professeur Raoul de, 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 de l'invitation de, de venir à Marseille. C'était magnifique cité. C'est la première fois pour moi à Marseille. C'est très froid, très froid à New York. Ici c'est bon, alors euh, merci beaucoup. Euh, je ne comprends pas les français. C'est seulement, j'ai appris seulement ça pour penser. Alors, right. um, so je vais parler de l'influenza et donner un petit peu plus général de ce que nous savons sur l'influenza, qui n'est pas si peu, malheureusement. Et je vais aussi vous donner un petit peu plus de ce que mon lab a été impliqué, ainsi que certains des latest research that we are conducting on the potential development of new improved influenza virus vaccines. Um, and I want to thank um, NIH uh, for funds for my work in the lab with influenza, which is uh, as, as a center of uh, excellence on influenza research at Sudan. So this is a picture, an electron micrograph of influenza viruses. Uh, This is a negative strand of the virus, and what you can see here is an envelope where the glycoproteins, hemagglutinin, and hemagglutinase are being inserted. These are the basis of the nomenclature of the virus, what we call H1N1, is hemagglutinin serotype 1, neuraminidase uh, serotype 1, and there are met multiple serotypes of both hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, the surface proteins of the virus. Here is the liquid envelope, and inside you see these eight dots, each dot. It's an RNA segment, and each RNA segment encodes for one or two proteins. So two RNA segments will encode will encode for the hemagglutin and the neuraminidase. And the rest of the proteins are depicted here. There are uh, three proteins that encode the RNA polymerase, that is required for RNA replication of the negative strand RNA, and that is also covered with a nuclear protein, which is another of the genes of, the, of influenza. You have the CHA and the NA that we talked before. And in addition, you have uh, an, M -pro an M gene that encodes for alternative splicing for the matrix protein, which is beneath the lipid bilayer, as well as for the M2 protein, which is this ion channel that is inserted in the, in the virus. Um, and it's important, this protein, for valency. And this is the basis for the two known inhibitors that are being used against influenza, the 2 and the neuraminidase. Neuraminidase inhibitors are the only ones that have been used right now for the treatment of influenza because M2 inhibitors against this ion channel, the virus that we have right now are resistant <coughs> to M2. So we have only one antiviral approved for the use for treatment of influenza, and it's known that viruses have become resistant before to this antiviral. So in terms of antivirals, we are not doing very well, and in terms of vaccines, also we are not doing very well. Uh, the NS uh, gene encodes for two proteins, NS1, which is a non-structural protein that is dedicated to evade innate immunity, and NS2 is, or NEP, is a minor component of the virion and is important for moving the nuclear proteins in and uh, out of the nucleus during the latest stage of infection. Now, in terms of um, epidemiology in humans, in humans we have two types of influenza virus. I saw you the a, influenza A virus, type A, but type B are very similar, except that antigenically they are unrelated. So uh, in general, the bodies against influenza A virus will not bind and will not neutralize influenza B virus. And all these, both influenza B and influenza A can cause influenza in humans, and they are circulating and they cause problems every year, seasonal influenza. Some years there is more B than A, some years there is more H3, more H, some years there is more H1, but still it's unclear why this is the case. And the reason why these viruses are able to continue infecting people is not 
because once that you get infected with influenza, you don't get good immune responses. A person that is infected, let's say, in the 90s with influenza B virus, will develop long-lasting immunity against influenza B virus and against this particular strain. In fact, people that they were born before 1918, that they suffer the 1918 epidemic of influenza virus, and they are still alive, you can get to the blood of these people, and then you can detect neutralizing antibodies still elicited against the 1918 strain. So once that you get infected with influenza, you get antibodies that prevents infection with the particular strain that you have been infected. But the problem with influenza is that the strain changes change from year to year. That's what is called antigenic drift, the hemagglutinin especially, which is the target of neutralizing antibodies, changes likely amino acids, and as it accumulates changes, then maybe 10 years later, the person who was infected negative with influenza B is now susceptible again to be infected with influenza B in 2000. So that's how, how this virus is able to reinfect, but in, influenza, in the case of influenza A, there is another thing that is even more traumatic, which is when the hemagglutinin completely changes antigenically. And these are the H1s, H2, H3, etc. So in the last uh, 100 years, there have been four pandemics for influenza virus. The first one that we know of in the last 100 years, 1918, Spanish influenza. Um, H, that was an H1N1. In 1957 came H2N2s. When these viruses came, hemagglutinin is very different from the hemagglutinin of H1N1. There is very little pre-existing immunity in humans uh, against this particular hemagglutinin. These people have never seen this H2. And this virus now is able to infect a lot of people because there is no pre-existing immunity. When this pandemic virus came, the H2 in 1957, the H1s disappeared. And now the H2 circulates in 1968, in which they were replaced by the third, pan by the third pandemic of the last century, the H3. And this one, the H2 also disappeared. In 1977, H1N1 came back. And this didn't cause the pandemic, they just started to co circulate again. And this virus was practically identical genetically to the virus that disappeared here. So the most likely scenario of where this virus came from was probably from a lab, since it's very difficult to explain why there was almost no changes for so many years between the H1s and ones that came and the H1s ones that, that uh, they, were, they disappeared here. So one need to be careful with this virus because this virus can actually be uh, infecting people if they escape labs if there is no pre-existing immunity. Nevertheless, this didn't cause a pandemic. We just started to coxiculate with these three and twos, and nothing happened, everything was very boring. Uh, everybody was on arms about H5s uh, being able to cause the next pandemic. Nobody would have been able to predict that the next pandemic didn't come from a new subtype of hemagglutinin, it came from an old subtype of hemagglutinin. H once again, that they, they were already circulated, but these H1s were antigenically, antigenically very different from these H1s over here. And there was again not so much persistent immunity in this caused the last pandemic, not so many people infected like in the last pandemic. And I will discuss a little bit why we think that that was the case. Now in influenza they always ask us which one is going to be the next pandemic. And the answer is we don't know. We have no idea how to predict what virus will make it. What we know is that there are cases of infections in humans with viruses coming from another subtypes of hemagglutinin that happen from time to time that come from viruses that are circulated in other animals. And the ones that people are paying more attention of are these H5N ones that appear, uh, this particular strain of H5N ones appear around 1992. And since it's, since it's spread in Southeast Asia in chicken mainly, that has been causing human infections from time to time. And people that are being diagnosed with this virus, usually there is 50% chances of mortality. Now, a lot of people will, you will hear that these viruses are 50% lethal. During 1918, the, the worst uh, um, epidemic of, of pandemic of influenza virus, there was 2% of, uh, of mortality being estimated, 2%, but a lot of people, so that's, that's a lot of people dying. Uh, to me, I think the H5s are, there's a lot of asymptomatic infections that are not being detected. So I don't, I don't believe in the 50% mortality, and if this virus ever make it into humans as a pandemic virus, because it adapts to transmission from human to human, I don't think it will be causing 50% mortality. 
but there is a lot of debate on that. Um, these virus have been causing problems for many years. They have been changing and still have not been able to adapt for transmission from human to human. There are other ones, like the H7s. I will talk a little bit about these H7 and 9 that are actually causing more human infections right now than the H5N1s. But still no transmission between human to human. And there is also concerns about this H3N2B. It's a swine influenza virus of the H3 subtype, but different from these H3s. And this is this caused some problems in kids in uh, related to going to uh, um, festivals of, of farms, farm festivals, um, for uh, where there are pigs that are being exposed, and kids become infected with this particular virus. But again, this has not caused a pandemic. There is concerns for the similarities that there are with the pandemic H1 and 1 today. So but the bottom line is that we don't know which virus is going to cause the pandemic, and this complicates how to prepare a vaccine against the next pandemic virus, because all of these are different hemagglutinins. So they need a different vaccine for each other, at least as we know right now the vaccine. Right now the vaccine is based on the circulating viruses, influenza B, H1, and H3, and it needs to be changed almost every year because the, the circulating virus changes from year to year, as I was telling you. And that also becomes very complicated in terms of vaccination. A seasonal vaccine, when there is a mismatch, it doesn't work very well, like right now with the H3s that are more prevalent, and there is a mismatch in the vaccine. The vaccine is based in the old H3 of the last year. The new strain is not uh, very, it's not being utilized very well by the vaccine. So where do these viruses come from? In general, influenza viruses can be found in multiple animals, but the, the ones where you find all subtypes of hemagglutinins are in aquatic birds. Um, they are circulating there in aquatic birds, ducks, geese, uh, using a fecal oral transmission. They actually replicate in the intestine of these animals. The strains that are, but in addition to finding strains here in wild birds, we find strains in poultry, strains in pigs, strains in humans, and strains in horses, and now also lately strains in dogs. And these are circulating within this host. They are being adapted to this particular host and they cause problems in this particular host. But from time to time, one strain from one host is able to jump into the other and becomes adapted to circulate into the other host. This can happen from one person to poultry, from poultry to pigs, from pigs into humans, from humans into pigs, etc. This is very rare occasions, they happen every 10, 20 years. But when this thing happens, a new antigenic, uh, new antigenic uh, variant of the virus is being introduced, and especially in humans, this is what caused the pandemic, what caused the H1s, H2, H3s pandemic. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the first pandemic, H1 and 1, 1918. As, as Didier was saying, we were involved in the reconstruction of this particular virus that was extinct. And that was a study that uh, my lab performed in collaboration with the labs of Chris Fassner, Peter Palese, Terry Tampi at the CDC, David Swain at the USDA, and Jeff Tavenberger at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology in the United States. And this illustrates, uh, this, this is a nice way how to illustrate what uh, was the impact of 1918 at the time that the, this strain came. This is the, la the U.S. life expectancy in the last century that has been increased uh, because of hygiene, hospitals, um, antibiotic use, etc. But there was a, this big dip here that happened in 1918, and this was just due to the pandemic of 1918. Quite uh, the pandemic that is, as far as we know, the worst pandemic that happened for influenza in humans. This is another way how to illustrate the, the consequence of this pandemic. This is a, a picture of the inhabitants of a village in a remote village in Alaska in 1918. And the picture was taken after this village ran through the pandemic of 1918. And what you can see here is that the only survivors here, the only people, they are the, the, the kids. All the adults of this village died of 1918 influenza infection. And this was particularly severe in remote areas that probably have less pre-existing immunity against any influenza virus. If the virus arrived there, then it wiped out all the adult population. The kids don't survive. And still it's unclear why there is this difference between adults and kids in terms of fighting the 1918 virus. Now, it has been a lot of interest in knowing how this virus was. It was more different from other viruses, um, other influenza viruses. But, and um, 
our collaborator, Jeff Tamerberger, has been sequencing this virus before rna seq techniques using traditional PCR techniques. And he has used two different types of specimens. One is at this paraffin embedded blocks with lung tissue coming from soldiers in the United States that died of flu in 1918. And there is a government-based um, uh, archiving of soldiers, tissue from soldiers that die of unknown diseases going and going since the Lincoln time in order to preserve tissue for future generations to study. And obviously the virus was not here, but what is still present is pieces of RNA from which the genome could be amplified. And the other source was in Alaska, in this small village that happened very similar to the other village that I show you. The, post, the postman came with the post and with the flu. All the adults died there in, in this village. When the news were spread, then uh, the government sent the army to bury the, the, the disease. And they were buried in a common foss under the permafrost line. So they have been frozen since 1918. And uh, tissue was dig out in 1997. Uh, there was not very well preserved, there was some tissue. Um, and again, there was no virus there, but there was pieces of, of RNA from which the virus could be sequenced. Now, if, uh, coming from these specimens, then uh, with the gene sequencing, you get the genome of the virus. And now, because we established techniques to reconstruct influenza viruses from plasmid DNA, you can do gene reconstruction using synthetic DNA techniques. And then by reverse genetics, uh, using these techniques that allows you to recover from plasmid DNA infectious viruses, recover the 1918 virus and the high bound container, and then look how these viruses look like in tissue corpus or, uh, or in animal. Now, the sequence of the virus at this time didn't tell nothing. There was nothing in there that one could see. There was uh, no determinants of pathogenicity of, of influenza virus. The one that is most uh, known is for the highly pathogenic H5 viruses. There is a particular motif in the hemagglutinin that is multibasic, that is present in these high pathogenic viruses. This motif was not present in these H1N1 viruses. There was nothing in the signature that will tell you that that was um, a, a specially given virus. And this is a, the first electron micros, a micrograph of this virus that was reconstructed, uh, taken by Terry Campy at the CDC. Now, what it became clear when we started to use animal models is that this virus was quite virulent, at least in this animal model. So you go into mice, for example, and you take mice and infect it with an H1N1 from 1991. And by the way, these H1N1s, they are descendants from the 1918. They have been Secreting in humans, changing from year to year, mm -hmm. with this gap that it was around 20 years, but then back, and then circulate again. You infect mice uh, with this 10 to the 6 intranasally, and nothing happened to the mice. They, are, they all survive. But if you take five genes from 1918, all is the, the polymerase genes, and three genes from, from the Texas 91, now this virus is quite different in mice. Animals start to die from day five. And if you take the whole reconstructed 1918, then animals uh, start to die at day three, very quickly. Now, if you just take out the hemagglutinin and, and replace it by the hemagglutinin of 1991, nothing happened. So that tells us that both the polymerases, as well as the hemagglutinin, they are involved in the pathogenesis of this virus in mice. And if we took viral tires in, in limes at day four, there is a correlation between survival and viral tires. So the, the virus that doesn't kill, the 3 pfu Times that they fall, the virus that kills 10 to the 6, the virus that kills quickly 10 to the 8, and this virus that doesn't kill 10 to the 5. So it looks like, at least in the case of 1918, one of the determinants of virulence, at least in this mouse model, is the ability to replicate very fast to very high times. Now, the same thing happens in ferrets. These are ferrets that are infected with the Texas H1N1 virus, the lives of these ferrets. There is very little inflammation. But in fact, in 1918, there's a huge amount of influence. So what do we know now about this virus that was reconstructed? Well, that is the only known human influenza virus that is lethal to mice, ferrets, macaques, and mRNA virus. So it looks like actually it was a more virulent virus than all the strains of influenza viruses that we know. Um, this doesn't mean that that was the only determinant of pathogenicity. There is still a lot of bacterial pneumonia that was causing disease secondary bacterial pneumonia in 1918, but at least it looked like the virus was one of the determinants of the virus. 
In terms of these animal models, the, the virulence is multifactorial. There are at least three, four genes that are involved in virulence, the hemagglutinin, the aluminidase, the MS1, and one of the small um, proteins encoded by the, by the polymerase gene, p one of 2 which is a non-structural gene with, whose function is still unclear, but it's a determinant of pathogenesis. And then the other thing that we know is that if you treat the animals with the actual antivirals, this virus is, is sensitive to antivirals, so you can prevent death. And also is being able, if you take a vaccine that is against this particular virus, is able to prevent um, uh, death and, and promote survival. So even though it was quite, it's quite virulent, at least it can be still handled by the existing antivirals and the existing vaccines if they are against this particular strain. <laughs> now, would the 1918 like H1 virus be today as we tell us in 1918? And I think the answer is, is no. There's, now we have antibiotics. Um, this is a very rare virus that it does. The virus doesn't want to be virulent, it doesn't want to kill the host. So it has happened that this virus came with these particular characteristics and maybe together with bacteria was causing this particular disease. I think this is a very rare case. So I don't think that it's going to be easy to get a virus like 1918 again in the human population that will cause so much problems. Even the H5M1s, if they come uh, adapted to humans, I don't think it will, they will cause as much problem as it was the 1918 virus. Now, H1 and ones came back in 2009. And why they came back? And I'm going to show you a study that we did um, with, uh, by a postdoc in my lab, Rafa Medina, and with all the postdocs in my lab, Palaji, in collaboration with Sirke from Peter Palace's lab. And we have also collaborated with Chris Basler and um, Terry Campy and Bob Bench. So this virus came in 2009. It's displaced this H1 and one. Where this virus came from? So this virus actually came from pigs, as we know, swine, swine influenza, it was called also swine flu. And what pig virus was this one? So again, there is influenza in pigs, and this virus comes, has a very complicated story. So um, there has been circulating in pigs mainly two strains of influenza viruses. In, the, in North America, classical H101 influenza virus, which actually came from 1918, and in Europe, in Europe and Asia, these uh, other uh, more modern swine uh, influenza viruses. <coughs> and at one moment, there was a reassortment. So this, this virus has a segmented genome. When they infect the same cell, they can exchange segments. And there was at one moment a reassortment between four viruses, an alien virus, a human virus that was on the screen too, and these two swine viruses that generated this particular virus, and this is the one that became pandemic. But this reassortment didn't take place just a few days or one year before the pandemic H101. This reassortment is believed to have been taking place at least 10 years ago. So what happened? This virus was never detected in swine. <coughs> this reassortment occurs 10 years ago. The virus was circulating in swine. Why this virus suddenly jumped into humans is still unclear. Why this particular virus and not this other virus of this virus? Now, one thing that became apparent when, when we sequenced this H101 is that there was no p one of 2 and this was one of the determinants of virulence of 1918. So we thought that probably this virus, although antigenically similar to 1918, will not be as, as bad as 1918, which is what actually was the case. But if you look to the hemagglutinin of this virus, the hemagglutinin came from the 1918 influenza virus hemagglutinin. So this virus, this h one ones have been secreted in humans till today changing the hemagglutinin antigenically. But in 1918, this virus also made it into pigs, and it's actually believed that humans get into pigs, more than pigs get into humans in 1918, although the evidence for that is, is not completely clear. And in pigs, this virus was also maintaining what is called classical swine influenza virus. And this is the one that gave the hemagglutinin for this reassortant pandemic H1. Now, while this hemagglutinin changed a lot in humans by changing the antigenic sites for this, because of this antigenic drift, the hemagglutinin of 1918 didn't change so much in, in swine. And why this didn't change so much in swine is still unclear. Well, one potential reason is that flu does, probably doesn't need to evade too much pre-existing immunity in pigs because pigs are short-lived and in general are being infected only once with influenza. So the virus doesn't need to evade pre-existing immunity in pigs and then maintain a hemagglutinin antigenically very similar to the one that came in 19. When the pandemic H1 and 1 came into humans, the infections were primarily being seen in children and young adults. And actually, that was very good news. And the reason why it's very good news 
is because most of the death of influenza virus infection occurs in the elderly. So if the virus, if this virus would have been able to infect the old people, then there would have been a lot of more uh, deaths caused by pandemic H101. But there were not so many, and one of the reasons is because the virus didn't infect well all people. Why did it infect all people? So when there was done serology studies, so presence of neutralizing antibodies against this virus in 2009 H21 in people older than 65 years old. So where these antibodies came from, and we speculated that it was due to prior exposure to early H101 viruses, like the 1990 virus. And in order to prove that that was the case, what we did is we generated antibodies against a bunch of H1s in mice, against um, the pandemic H101, but against 1918, H1 from 1930, from 1940, from 1970, from 1980, 1990, etc. And then after generating antibodies, we challenged these mice with pandemic H1. So we vaccinated with different uh, uh, hemagglutinins from different years, uh, and then we challenged with uh, pandemic H1. And what we found is that all these vaccinated animals are protected, and it was animals that were vaccinated with the homologous vaccine against pandemic H1, but also against human influenza viruses like 1918 and viruses from the 30s and from the 40s. While if they are immunized with viruses H1s from the 70s, the 80s and the 90s, the ones that they were circulating before the pandemic H101, these are not protected from death. So it looks like antigenically the H101 is very similar to the all influenza viruses circulating humans. People, all people that were exposed to these all H1N1s still have antibodies that prevent infection with the new H1. And this can be seen also by looking to the hemagglutinin. So this is the hemagglutinin of 1918, the crystal structure seen from the top. This is uh, seen from the side. And this is a trimer here. This is one of the monomers. This is a trimer from the top. And here in light blue, you see the antigenic sites that are uh, targeted for neutralizing antibodies. Now, if you look to the all seasonal H1 and 1s, the ones that disappeared in 2009, these are the number of changes that there have been in this hemagglutinin since 1918. A lot of changes, antigenically very different. But if you look to this pandemic H101, whose hemagglutinin was in peaks from 1918 till it jumped into human, there is less chances, changes, and especially this area here, which is a main antigenic site, is completely conserved between 1918 and the new H101. So antibodies against this um, 1918 epitope will neutralize also the H101. What this study tells is first that people carrying antibodies against H101 viruses that's the great 1918, and actually I didn't saw that, but uh, the ones people that were vaccinated against the swine influenza virus that caused a scare in the United States because they thought it was going to be the next pandemic, they were also protected. And that's because this virus is very similar to the pandemic H101. And the other that that's something that we didn't know is that pigs can act as reservoirs for strains that become antigenically frozen. And once that there is enough time and there is less people, less people with less pre-existing immunity, a lot of newborns that have never been exposed to these old viruses, now this, this virus can jump from pigs into human. And we need to have in mind that we have H3s now in pigs, that they have been circulating in pigs for 20 years, and there are new H1s also in pigs that have been circulating in pigs for 15 years. So this is something that we need to be worried about. And hopefully, I mean, the best way to me to prevent this from any virus from this to coming into humans is to control them in the swine population instead of waiting for the jump. Now, what happens if you get vaccinated against H1N1, uh, the new H1N1, or, or if you um, get uh, infected with the new H1N1? Would your antibodies also neutralize the 1918 virus, the old virus? And the answer is yes. So, in collaboration with Bob Belsi, we took people that were immunized against the new H1 and 1, and then we looked for antibodies, the race of antibodies, neutralizing antibodies against the new H1 and 1. These are the antibodies.